I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in this chair of wisdom, this mighty chair of wisdom, and answer all your questions about the First World War. Uh, e. Jasso says, hello, Indian crew. My great grand hello, E. Jasso. My great grandfather was drafted in the first US draft of World War I and served as a corporal and then a sergeant in the 360th Infantry Regiment of the 90th Infantry Division in what his commanding officer, First Lieutenant Preston G. Northrop, called the Suicide Club or the Trench Mortar Battery. Aha. Though he served in the Saint Michel Offensive, the Meuse Argonne, and the occupation of Germany, he never spoke to anyone about the war. And I've been having trouble finding information about trench mortar batteries and what they did. In particular, a letter our family has from Lieutenant Northrop states, my great grandfather was leading men over the top. What was the role of trench mortars as opposed to artillery? Would the men generally fire a volley and then go over the top with the other soldiers? Thank you all for an amazing show and best of luck in the future. That was very nice. Okay. Um, okay, the mortar, mortars. Uh, most armies made the difference in where heavy and medium trench mortars were placed, you know, under the command of an artillery officer, while light trench mortars were given over to the infantry. The heavy mortars and Minenwerfer were used to actively destroy and devastate trenches, obstacles, and defensive positions, while the light mortars, on the other hand, were used mainly to suppress the enemy's snipers and machine gunners. Um, they played a major role in offensive and defensive operations, like in supporting raiding parties or to quickly switch fire on advancing infantry. Um, light mortars were fairly inaccurate, but could be reloaded very quickly and were therefore a tactical support weapon. A British mortar battery in 1916 would consist of four times three Stoke mortars, for example. However, trench mortars could also be dangerous for the operators themselves. Maybe that's where the nickname Suicide Club came from. Uh, particularly the early versions were crude devices and ammunition was often manufactured with simple black powder charges and it could misfire or detonate prematurely, right? Uh, for some time, married men were forbidden to join the trench mortar batteries just because of the fact that ammunition accidents could kill whole mortar teams in one fatal misfire. Uh, this and the fact that you needed skill in aiming and handling the devices led to the formation of specialists. But other than that, the subject of trench mortar batteries isn't really that well researched. Uh, many rumors still persist, like, um, maybe you don't want to hear this, but like it was a place for the undesirables of a platoon or that the batteries oh, were so hated by the enemy that they could expect no mercy from the enemy during an attack. Uh, if anyone out there knows a good book on this, please let us know. Uh, Brian Tanner. Hey, Indian crew. During the Great War, Germany threatened to execute American soldiers using trench shotguns and also threatened British engineers whose bayonets had a saw on the spine of the bayonet. How could they justify using chemical weapons that cause death and horrific damage to eyes and lungs, but object to shotguns and sawback bayonets? Well, it, yeah, it's hard for us to understand today why in a war that has seen aerial bombardment, poison gas, razor sharp shrapnel, barbed wire, yada, 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 why people would attempt to outlaw other weapons. The justification and reasoning behind these differences might be a bit hard to comprehend, so just bear with me for a sec. The intentional idea, as abstruse as this sounds, the intentional idea of chemical warfare was not to kill. It was intended to panic and incapacitate the enemy soldiers. Since it did not kill instantly like a bullet or shrapnel, it was expected that the enemy would abandon his post after his trench was hit by a gas grenade. If he stayed in the poisonous gas, well, it was his own fault, right? The apologists applied the same reasoning to flamethrowers. They were intended to scare and shock the enemy into capitulation. Most people realize the cynical truth behind that vindication. But to be completely honest, the morale effect of both those weapons was more apparent 
than the killing capacity. Comparatively few men died of gas or from flamethrowers, but nonetheless, the wounds were gruesome and painful and many still died because of those weapons. With the shotguns and sawback bayonets, the reasoning was different. Those weapons were intended to kill from the start, but the reason they were considered inhumane was that, say, a normal bullet or the blade of a normal bayonet would either result in a relatively clean kill or a treatable wound. Buckshot pellets and the sawtooth bayonets would result in those wounds, those wounds being fatal as the organs and arter arteries were damaged much more often. Those weapons would lead to a wounded soldier inevitably dying in agony without being able to be saved by a doctor. And that was the torture, you see. Uh, Mackenzie Buckle, that's a cool name. Is that a made up name? No. Oh. Uh, Mackenzie Buckle writes, Hello Indian crew, love the show. I have a question about equipment that Canadian soldiers were issued. That they were issued shovels with holes in them, that the Canadian Ross rifle was not well liked by troops. If that's true, uh, if so, why? Is that true? If so, why? Right. Um, well, the shovel with the hole in them was actually called the McAdam or the Hughes shovel. Uh, it was patented in 1913 by Canadian Minister of Defense and Militia Sam Hughes. The idea behind it was to give the soldier a portable shovel, okay, but one he could also use as a shield. See, the handle of the shovel could be bent to the side to reveal a spike that could be rammed into the earth. The hole in the spade was for sticking your rifle through, right? Uh, at the time, this was inspired by fortifications on the Swiss border. But during the war, you can see those types of shields in the trenches, mostly on the German-French front. Uh, the idea was theoretically solid, but to actually deflect a bullet, the steel had to be way thicker than usual, like 4.7 millimeters, and that had a weight of five pounds. What's that, 2.3 kilos? But it was still not enough to stop a bullet, only lighter shrapnel. 25,000 of these shovels were ordered by Hughes at the cost of $34,000, was a lot of money back in those times. Um, but the field tests were disappointing. In the end, it was a lackluster combination of a shovel that was too heavy and a shield that was too thin. They were either, they were either scrapped or used to strengthen parapets. Uh, the Ross rifle you asked about, or the Ross Mark III, this, yeah, also endorsed by Sam Hughes as a highly accurate, reliable weapon for the Canadian soldiers. Now, this is not entirely untrue in clean, open warfare or hunters in the Canadian wilderness. But for trench warfare, this rifle was just way too heavy. It was, it was longer than the Lee Enfield, and it was really easily affected by the mud and dirt of the trenches. Uh, its biggest weakness was its very finicky bolt, which would not only jam really easily under those conditions, but could also easily be assembled wrong uh, if the soldier tried to clean it. And this could either lead to brick the rifle or in the worst case, blow the bolt up into the face of the shooter. It wasn't a terrible rifle per se, no, but it was for trench warfare. Some Canadian snipers preferred them though because of their higher accuracy. The failure of both of these products would contribute to the downfall of Sam Hughes. Uh, actually, Canada managed to fix those problems with the Ross rifle, and they were ready for reshipment, but the Canadian soldiers in the field hated the Ross rifle so much they wouldn't take them. Now, our friend Othias, who has C and Arsenal, an awesome channel, did an episode about the Ross rifle. You can click right here if you want to see that. And we will see you next time and every time. See you soon.